Greetings, fellow runners. It's time for Q&A. You guys sent in lots of great questions and I'm going to answer them for you in this video. Uh, let's go. So first question from Jacob. Would you still run if there were no running races ever? And the answer to that is very simple, very easy to answer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, for me, running races are, well, it's a lot of fun and it's, it gives structure to my training and, you know, gives me a goal and something to measure myself up against and, uh, and to achieve certain times, etc. So I love races and as I said, they do give structure to my training. But my real joy from running comes from the everyday grind, doing the training and seeing the improvements and also just the joy of running itself. I, even if I didn't have a watch and I didn't care about times and I didn't have any races, I, I would still be out there running almost every day, I think, because it's just such a nice way to just get out, move, and it just feels good. So the answer is yes, I would still run if there were no races. Lee Louch asks, what are the benefits of incline walking? Uh, 15, percent incline on a treadmill for your overall endurance. Um, yeah, incline walking is, is great. I mean, you know, you would be walking a pretty slow pace, but uh, you would be breathing pretty hard. So it would be pretty, you know, pretty mild on your structural system. Your legs wouldn't really be that much taxed because it's so slow, but you would still be able to breathe. So um, for someone with well, you know, it really depends. I would say that that's fine, but you do get good at what you're doing. So, you know, if you get if you do a lot of incline walking, you'll get good at incline walking. If you want to be good at running, you should probably do more running. So, I would say that although there might there are definitely benefits, I would probably look at incline walking as more of a type of cross training, something you can do um, to sort of alleviate or to to add very um, to add variation into your running routine rather than something that you do specifically to get better at running. Uh, that would, it would probably then be better to just run at a comfortable pace, easy pace, and and um, and also do workouts, of course, and, and just generally train more specific. Uh, but great incline walking can still be great. I'm just going to check that I'm still filming here. Yes, sometimes it shuts off. And I'm gonna try to do this as a no editing clip. So, all right, uh, next question from Amadeus. He asks, what do you think about training with small weights for an unproportional muscle uh, situation? It's not too healthy long-term, but I was wondering about running with weights. Okay, so I assume you're, you mean like running, holding small weights or perhaps wearing a weight vest or something like that. Um, I would say no. I would not recommend doing it, actually. Uh, I'm not a fan of the weight vest idea. Uh, unless you're training for a race where you need to carry a big backpack, or you're training to get better at carrying a backpack, or pulling something heavy or whatever. Again, it's the specificity thing. If you just want to be good at running, though, you could take off the weight vest and just run faster instead. And it would be the same stimulus but it would be more specific to a more appropriate running pace so in this case with if you have muscle imbalances where perhaps one leg has uh, has some weaknesses compared to the other leg or, or or arms or whatever i think probably the better thing to do would be to work on form drills to do running drills where you practice your form and work on sort of becoming more symmetrical in how you move and also do strength training, uh, specific training in the gym to strengthen those muscles that are uh, weaker. And of course, over time, as long as you keep, as long as you stimulate both sides of the of the body equally. So if I'm assuming that you meant like running with maybe one weight because your right side is weaker than your left and you want to strengthen it, I think it's better to just train both the, both sides by doing single hand movements or single leg movements or whatever. And then over time, uh, it's gonna actually equal out. So that's my recommendation there. 
Uh, Jan wants to know, do you have at this point in time the endurance to do the marathon without going in the basement? Really, you know, giving it all you have and, and being really wiped out. And what time do you expect for the run? Good question. I think yes. I mean, right now I'm sort of coming back from injury and I'm building up my endurance in terms of my ability to do long runs. And I haven't done a lot of long runs now. So I think if I went out now and did a marathon, I definitely am confident that I could finish it, but it would trash my legs because I haven't done the necessary training. Uh, if we're talking more about like in general, uh, when I'm in good training without having actually done a full um, marathon build up, I think I could, and even today, if we ignore the sort of muscular endurance aspect of it, I, I'm pretty sure I could pull pull out a, like a marathon uh, in like, let's say three and a half hour, a three and a half hour marathon for me at this point, I think would would feel pretty doable, not, not really that big a deal. Um, but then again, a marathon is so long that it's almost always a big deal. <laughs> and I'm not gonna pretend there and say like, like it's no big deal because I haven't even tried a marathon, so I don't know. But um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I could do a, a marathon now at in 3.30, but it would be pretty tough for my legs. He also wants to know how many kilometers I run each week uh, and the, the answer to that now is that I'm currently at about 50 kilometers per week so I got up to about 100k back in um, 2019 and then I had some health issues and then I've had an injury and another injury whole, like it's been a big mess for the last year essentially but I'm starting to get back to it 50k a week and I'm hoping to get back up to 100k per week by the end of the year and then keep building on that towards essentially more and more mileage as much as I can tolerate over the next you know five years or so and then we'll see. He also says that Sylvester Stallone trained two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening for Rambo and that's that's a lot of training and that's that's cool. All right Donna wants to ask and Donna is actually my coaching client. <laughs> she wants to know do you recommend having a snack prior, unless there's someone else with the same name though? Uh, I don't think so though. Do you recommend having a snack prior to the to a morning run rather than running on empty? Does this affect cortisol levels and fat burning for the remainder of the day? Uh, it really depends a lot on the person. Uh, so fat burning is mostly affected by just running in general, okay? And it's not like eating carbs even on a run will de destroy your fat burning on that run like some people think. So I feel like if you have a snack before or if you have a snack during or any time you have a snack, um, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, in terms of your cortisol levels, I would, I would imagine, and I'm, this is just speculation, but I would imagine that um, cortisol levels would be better overall if you do have a snack, it's it's quite taxing. It depends on the run, right? Like if you go for a really long run in the morning on empty and you're like maybe glycogen depleted after sleeping, your liver is out of glycogen. So you're essentially sort of getting into some blood sugar issues. This would be pretty taxing to your to your system and perhaps even cause a, a sort of cortisol issue long term. So I, I would say that if you wake up and you're just going for a short run, you don't have to think about it. You can just go for a run. But then again, if you do feel like having a snack, like having a banana maybe, that could also be a good idea. Certainly if you end up noticing over time that your quality of the run, like suppose you're going out for an hour every morning or something. And well, I know the training that you're doing, of course, Donna, but uh, suppose someone was going out every morning for an hour, for example, they, um, as long as they feel like that's fine and they, they have good quality on the run and they feel good without having a snack, then there's, that's probably fine. But if they feel like they need it, then they probably need it and they should take it. So it really depends on the person and I recommend just following the, the, the body basically. And I, the, it's not gonna affect your fat burning too much. Uh, as a runner, as in terms of your fitness, uh, progression uh, running itself is going to stimulate that fat burning quite a lot even if you do eat a snack Philip says as a fellow flat footer what obstacles have you experienced and what practices to alleviate it 
Uh, I'm actually not really a flat footer. I don't have a flat foot. I, I have actually quite a high arch, uh, but I do pronate uh, quite a lot. Pronation is fine though. It's natural. It's normal. Um, I pronate a little bit more than normal and it's probably because of my ankle mobility being very limited due to some injuries in the past, etc. Like in the way, as, as a child, like way back. Um, so I, I sort of pronate by cheating essentially without going through the ankle joint I go around it, right? Uh, but I'm not really flat footed, but I have really, really wide feet. Okay, so that's probably why you're thinking uh, that I'm flat footed. If you are flat footed though, you know, it's it's probably okay, you know, unless it leads to injuries, uh, it's probably okay. We, we're all different and we don't have to necessarily change the way we are too much, but we can make an effort, of course, if we think it might be beneficial or if it's causing problems. So I would suggest perhaps just doing things like ankle, uh, sorry, um, towel grabs. Is that what they go? When you, when you have your foot on a towel and you sort of grab the towel, uh, if you look up exercises for plantar fascia, plantar fasciitis, uh, you'll see, you'll find some exercises that sort of strengthens the plantar fascia and the arch. Um, you could just search for arch training. Um, there are some exercises that will, that will sort of strengthen the arch a little bit and, and get, get that happening, uh, which is going to, might be beneficial. Uh, also maybe uh, running in shoes that are wide enough for your feet so that you can really splay your toes and perhaps running barefoot as well would be a good way to sort of strengthen that arch and walking around more barefoot. Um, that's probably my recommendations. I'm gonna check the camera again. I'm so, I'm so paranoid uh, because it's sometimes it's just stopping, uh, which is weird. Busy wave. Why does running make me feel weighted down like I'm wearing heavy boots? I'm about 15 pounds overweight, but I had the same feeling when I was a normal weight. Well, yeah, I mean, you can sometimes feel heavy running. Chances are you're maybe running a little faster than you should, like you're maybe pushing the pace so much that it's actually quite a um, intense run and then you're gonna basically feel heavy. <laughs> it could be the, uh, the, the reason. Uh, maybe in that case, just, just take it easy. Just, just ease up on the pace and just take it easy and relax and enjoy it and you might feel better. Another reason sometimes why you might feel heavy is if you're not getting enough carbohydrate. Uh, it's very common for runners to talk about heavy legs when they're not carbed up to the max. So definitely focus your diet around carbohydrates. Get at least 70 to 80% of, car of your calories from carbohydrates. That's my recommendation. And that could help. Look at your sleep, of course. That's uh, a situation as well. And then... I notice that I feel heavy, as in my physical weight feels heavier when I'm running while being sore. Or if I'm like, let's say I'm sore from a from a strength workout the day before or something, then I can feel really physically heavy. And I think it's because the muscle fibers aren't firing. Well, they're firing, but they're a lot of the muscle fibers are not able to produce enough power because they're going through this inflammation process as a result of the strength training, perhaps. So look a little bit at on the timing maybe of when you're running compared to other things. It could be, you know, perhaps that's what it is. Uh, it could also be that you are, are wearing heavy boots. I don't know, are, you, are your shoes running shoes or are they heavy boots? That could be a situation too. Rob, snow looks pretty, opposite weather here, minus 36. Uh, wow. Um, when they say, or, or we're probably talking about 36 degrees plus actually. Anyway, question is, when they say training at altitude can be beneficial for elite athletes, what actually does it do to the system? How long does it take to reap the benefits? How high above sea level is considered altitude training anyway? Great question, huge question. Very simply put, when you go up in altitude, uh, the, pr the pressure there is lower. So there's essentially less oxygen per square or per cubicle, anyway, less ox oxygen for the same volume, okay? Less oxygen in the air, essentially. And you are, the, the pressure of oxygen compared to the, the content of oxygen in your blood, called the, the partial pressure, um, is less because there's less oxygen in the air, okay? Kind of weird way of explaining it, but 
The point is that you're not able to get as much oxygen into your system as you do when you're at sea level. And this means that you have less oxygen to, to, to do the work. And oxygen is really key in doing the aerobic metabolism that's necessary for running. So um, the higher up you get, the less oxygen you're able to take in and uh, the, the less you're going to be able to produce work. And so um, that's what happens. And this is good, of course, because the body adapts. Okay, so when the body is experiencing this hypoxic situation, which means that it doesn't have enough oxygen, over time it produces more red blood cells and with more hemoglobin. And these red blood cells with the hemoglobin transport oxygen. So you essentially get more oxygen carrying um, cells. And that means you can sort of tolerate the reduced oxygen level. And then when you then go down to sea level again, suddenly you have a an excess of, of red blood cells and you're able to take up even more oxygen than someone else at the same uh, at the sea level. Anyway, so that's the idea. How high? Um, well, the high, it's it's pretty linear, okay? So, but you'll notice mostly an effect uh, for 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 um, endurance training. They talk about things like they talk about altitudes like 1500 meters at least, maybe 1800 meters. Really, that's like medium to low altitude, and then the ideal altitude is like 2000 meters, 2003, 2005 maybe, up perhaps as high as 3000 meters. So let's just say plus just above 2000 meters is probably ideal and you you need to be there for like three weeks probably for the for the optimal effect maybe even longer so three to six weeks maybe is really ideal for getting that effect and then you go down to sea level and the effect lasts um also three to six weeks or something like that i think very interesting topic vegan pajamas Brand new runner hair. I want to start running, but walking a lot has given me mild plantar fasciitis. Can I still do light jogging? I'd say yes, you can still do light jogging unless it makes your plantar fasciitis worse. And you have to just keep an eye on it. And perhaps do some of those exercises that I talked about earlier in this video about um, strengthening your arch and strengthening the plantar, plantar fascia. Um, and it's just a matter of keeping an eye on it, really. And as long as it doesn't get, uh, get worse with jogging, you can definitely do that. Perhaps consider reducing the walking a little bit and, and balancing it out. Efferescent bubbles. How do you feel about running magazines? I like running magazines because it's just a casual read, you know. You don't have to commit. You can just look at the pictures and read little things there and there. So I quite like reading it. But of course, you do have to take it with a grain of salt because there's... You know, they're all about the hype, all, you know, fancy sort of big things um, uh, that they sort of blow it out of proportion sometimes, you know, where um, they take science and they sort of make it into entertainment, right? So, well, some magazines are better than others, so. Um, 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 Dennis. He would like to know how to safely increase mileage. I've said in the past, you know, that you increase it, stay stable for four to six weeks, and then you can do it, you can increase again, but only one aspect at a time. How much should we increase when we increase it? And he's building up his mileage. He's currently at 23 to 25k per week. Also, with this approach, are there so called down weeks, or is it all just no down weeks? Um, his goal is to keep injury free, build up mileage to half marathon, struggle with injuries. Okay, great question. Um, yeah, well, first of all, how much can you increase? Well, it really depends on the person, their history, their goals, how fast they want to progress. But I would say anywhere between 10 to 30% of your mileage you can increase from one week to the next. Um, someone like you currently at like 25k per week. Uh, you know, a conservative jump would probably be to go to 30, right? But you could perhaps even go to 35. I probably wouldn't go much longer than that, though. So let's say you do go to 30. You jump up to 30, um, and then you stay there for two weeks, perhaps. Okay, so when I said like four weeks, and then you increase it again and again, like a plateau kind of thing, that's sort of the general principle. But 
in practice, it, it's going to be more up and down. So yes, they are, there are down weeks. So in your case, I would probably do something like 25. You're at there uh, that now, and then you would go up to like 30. You would keep it at 30 again, and then you go down to 25 again, go back up to 30. Then you can jump up to 35, and perhaps depending on how that feels, you go straight down to 30 again the next week, or you can maintain one more week at 35 before going down to 30. And then you'll do a couple of weeks at 30 again, back up to 35, and then another week at 35 perhaps, back down to 30, and now you can jump all the way up to 38 or 40 or, you know, depending on how it feels and, and how sustainable it is. So you model it and, and really you can have a plan, but at the end of the day, you have to just um, feel it and, and constantly modify your plan a little bit along the way, which is why it's good to have a coach uh, or to just pay very good attention to your training yourself. Keep a training log, um, log all your training, have a plan. And, and incorporate those down weeks, but don't have a rigid plan where it's like two weeks up, one week down, two weeks up, one week down. Um, that can be the general idea, but then you, you do want to sort of ask yourself, you know, how are the legs feeling? Is it a bit too much? Yes, let's take it down a notch if it feels a bit too much. But if it's like totally fine, we'll keep it at that for a little longer or, or, or go even further up. And remember that it's cumulative. Mileage is cumulative, so one week at a higher mileage might feel fine, but two weeks, that's when you start noticing that it, it takes a toll and you might want to bring it down again before going back up. So that's the idea. Good luck with your half marathons. Let us know about how it goes. Sophie, uh, she has a long question. I've already read it, so I'm just going to sort of summarize it a little bit. She wants to know how to keep intervals interesting. Uh, she gets stuck with the sessions. She, ha she has her bread and butter type sessions, you know, classic six times 800 meters, 10 times 400 meter type of sessions. And she wants to know how to spice it up. Well, first of all, I would say that those are great sessions. And I'm, I'm actually a big fan of not spicing it up too much. I'm a big fan of actually just keeping it steady. I do recommend this book. Daniel's running formula. It's just very simple, straightforward sessions. Essentially, what you're trying to do is just accumulate time at different intensities. And over time, you'll build the amount of time that you can do on each session. So if you're used to doing 10 times 400 meter at threshold, well, maybe you start trying 10, 000, 10 times 1000 meters at threshold. Um, you could also, of course, if you want to spice it up after all, you could do pyramid sessions where you, you run uh, longer and longer intervals uh, at well you'll start and then you'll build up the length of the interval and then you'll build them down again in a session or you could do the same with speed where you run faster and faster uh, you could have a session where you do both threshold and speed work in the same session and you mix it up a little bit there are countless types of sessions out there uh, if you want to be casual about it though and play around with just like a fun session you could do a fart leg which could either be like a completely um, random, like a traditional original type of fart lick where you just go out and run and you randomly choose to run faster at random times. So like just, oh, let's go fast up this hill or okay, let's, let's hit the gas and go threshold type of intensity for like a, a kilometer or two. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's do a sprint over this little area or you just sort of play around with the speed a little bit. Um, a more modern type of fart leg is where you do like maybe 1k on, 1k off, 1k on, 1k off, or uh, 1 minute on, 1 minute off, or 2k on, 1k off, whatever, where the on perhaps might be like your marathon pace or your half marathon pace or threshold pace, and off might be a little bit slower than that, but still pretty steady. And you can do it as a continual run. Those are some ideas anyway. How to build upper body for runners without a gym, okay? Well, first of all, depends on your goals, right? But if you are a runner and you're looking to perform well as a runner, I wouldn't actually do upper body gym work, to be honest. You say you lost the muscle mass now that the gyms have closed. Well, that's probably a good thing for your running performance. Uh, I would probably focus more on lifting for the legs. It's so like deadlifts, squats, lunges, hip core exercises, but arms and upper body, that weight isn't really going to help you run faster, but it will make you heavier, which is going to make you slower as a runner. So 
that's my opinion on it. I wouldn't actually do upper body strength. But if you are interested in doing it or you just want to maintain like a healthy upper body, not really that much muscle bulk, but you just want to stay healthy, perhaps you could just do the classics, you know? You could just do some push-ups. Push-ups are great. Uh, you can do uh, pull-ups if you get a pull-up bar or if you can hang from a tree or you can hang under your table and do like essentially rowing, right? Where you hang under a table and pull yourself up almost like a pull-up. Um, those will be my, my thoughts, I guess. Uh, food run balance is very difficult. How to gauge how much calories you need or even to gain muscle, etc. Tried calculators, but they don't work. Um, timing. Well, to be honest, the way I do it is that I eat the same thing pretty much every day. Or I have a, I have a very, very good idea of exactly what I'm eating. And then I weigh myself at regular intervals. You can do it every day or you could do it once a week. It's probably better. You weigh yourself once a week and if you see your weight dropping, then you can conclude that whatever you are eating is not enough. Um, and you are losing weight. Or if you're gaining weight, you can say whatever you're eating is probably more than you need, right? And then that's fat weight really when it relates to food. Uh, but of course, if you're building muscle, then you're gonna gain some muscle too. But in order to gain muscle, you definitely need to eat more than your maintenance level of calories. So if you're building, working on in the gym and you're doing muscle training and you're, you're not seeing an increase in your weight over the course of several months, uh, you could conclude that you need to eat more, essentially. It could also be related to your training details, right? Like maybe you need to train differently, of course, but typically uh, eating more will result in weight gain, even if it's some of it is fat. Um, so, and some of it will be muscle if you're, if you're lifting weights, I think, you know, it depends on the situation. But um, I guess my answer is that uh, like when I, when I eat a banana, I just, I count a hundred calories, right? It might be more, it might be less, but over time it sort of averages out and I get my own idea of how, like of what a calorie is. It's sort of like calibrating based on what you're eating. So over time, I know that I eat about, I need about 2,300 calories plus my exercise calories. Doesn't matter if that's actually 2,300 calories or not, the food that I'm eating. Uh, what matters is that I've found that what, I found out that what I call 2,300 calories uh, works <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying it's kind of difficult to explain but the main point is just monitor your your food intake and monitor your weight over time and calibrate it based on whether you go up or down in weight if, if you want to talk more about it maybe you could send me a message on my website there's a link in the description to my website send me a personal message there or like an email essentially and we can talk more about it we could even do a coaching session if you want to discuss it more in detail Officer Doofy, what's your diet? Well, how do you sum up a diet in like just like a few sentences? I don't know. Well, I'm vegan. I eat a whole food plant-based diet. I eat lots of fruit. I eat lots of vegetables. I eat oatmeal. I eat uh, currently bake my own bread. Um, yeah, I, and I take a bunch of supplements too. Huldid wants to know would it be possible for someone with weak knees to work up and have a running practice? I've tried in the past, but my knees started hurting. I gave up. I might have gone too fast forward in the process. Let's make sure it's still filming. It's still filming. Oh, wow. Half an hour. <laughs> that's a long video. But I guess that's how it is when you do, when you do Q and A. So, um, well, the main thing is build up slowly, okay? Build up slowly. Maybe you went too fast, like you said yourself, right? So take it slowly, build it up gradually. That's your main thing. And whatever you think is gradual, do it even more gradual. And whatever you think is a slow progress, do it even slower than that. Give yourself like a year to get, to slowly increase your running practice and get to a point where you're running regularly. Uh, or at least six months, right? Um, if you, if you have knee issues, you know, it could be related to several things. It could be that you're pretty weak, maybe, in the quads, the stabilize the knee, uh, in the muscles around the knee. So perhaps you would be well off doing some strength training, maybe lifting some weights even. Again, you have to start very gradual, though. Um, 
And also it could be related to your running form. Perhaps if you, if you notice that you're landing with the foot quite in, far in front of you uh, with a straight knee, that's probably, oh, well, that's definitely not good for your knees. So make sure you're landing more underneath your center of mass uh, with a little bit of a bent knee, okay? And the easiest way to do that is just to increase your cadence, just to run a little bit more steps per minute. Take a little shorter steps and instead of doing like, you know, boom, 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 you do more like, boop, 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 you know, like you're a little tiny dog. <laughs> Imagine that you're a tiny dog and you'll be fine. Well, there, there are many reasons why someone might have knee issues, but strengthening the knees, strengthening the legs, uh, doing exercises like that, and most of all, just building up very gradually. Start by going for a walk and running just, just run like two minutes. And then the next day, two days later or whatever, you can run three minutes and just take it very, very gradual and you'll probably be fine. And of course you can contact me as well if you want to have a coaching session and talk about it or we can make a training program for you or anything like that if you're interested. Are the bear uh, sense, um, how much impact do you think diet plays in performance? And he or she talks about um, how a lot of uh, fitness influencers and trainers, etc. Uh, speak of very strict diets and when you see a lot of the top athletes, they're not really eating a perfect diet. They seem to eat sometimes quite unhealthy. Um, yeah, let's do that first. So, well, the main thing for performance, okay, is going to be hydration, uh, calories, and carbohydrate, okay? So even if your diet is crap in terms of quality, as long as you're getting enough calories and you're getting plenty of carbohydrates and you're staying hydrated and you're getting enough sleep and all that, um, that's going to be the main factors affecting your performance, okay? Then, of course, there's all the micronutrients and the quality of your food which will affect your health and your health is closely linked, of course, to your performance, okay? Um, but you got to remember also that health this is sort of like a cumulative thing so when you're looking at some of the best performers they're typically in their 20s or perhaps 30s right so they're very young and um, and when they're young when humans are young you can sort of get away with a lot because the body is still running on youth if you know what i mean it's it's it hasn't been worn down yet and the cumulative effects of an unhealthy diet and lifestyle hasn't yet caught up and they sort of compensate a little bit by being very active right so that's one of the factors and then in terms of like are they really eating that healthy or not i don't know it depends on the individual right but a lot of the times they will have a diet that's actually very healthy and on top of that they'll also have some unhealthy foods like candy and stuff and in that case i don't think it matters that much because they're still getting all the nutrients in through a healthy diet but their their calorie needs are so large that they can also eat junk on top of that and that wouldn't be as bad as if someone had low calorie intake and just ate junk. You know what I mean? Because they, they would miss out on a lot of nutrition. Whereas the elite athletes, they typically get what they need because they're just eating so much in general. Um, that's also an aspect of it. Uh, another aspect is whether or not an athlete would actually be even better if they optimized their diet. And the answer, I think, is yes. So if you have a person, an athlete performing great but having a pretty crappy diet, um, and they're still at the elite level, well, maybe they would be even better if they had a better diet. So are they good because of their crappy diet or are they good in spite of it, right? Next question is, what's your most controversial topic on either training or nut nutrition? That's difficult to answer. I think it depends how you look at it. Some of my opinions are controversial for most people and for, for the mainstream and according to like mainstream media it's controversial like for example um, carbohydrates are super important to human health we need to eat lots of carbs sugar is not really a big problem it's in, in fact it's it's one of the best things you can have in your diet in the form of fruit and and also just carbs 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 are awesome as an as an athlete right and and for health for the majority of people and for, because of the mainstream media, that's probably a controversial opinion. But if you look at the science, it's actually not a controversial opinion at all. It's, it's the consensus. It's 
um, there's so much science backing up the idea of eating a carbohydrate focused diet, predominantly carbohydrate, and also um, performance data on carbohydrate supplementation leading to better performance. So I guess that would be one, of, one way to answer that question. Um, last question from R the Bear. How do you tell if you're responding to a particular session in order to determine what session you need in your training regimen? Cheers from Hegedal. Wow, okay, so you're just around the corner, uh, literally. Uh, so, well, not literally, but close by. So that's a difficult question to answer, to be honest. Um, I would say the best way to do it is to keep a training log and to over time, and when I say over time, I really mean over years of training, observe when you have your best performances and then look at what you did in order to get those performances. Uh, that would be the only real way to know, but in terms of the, and even then you wouldn't truly know, but in terms of the short term, probably just whatever feels the best for you and where you can notice that it gives you more than it takes from you. Um, but it's a challenging thing to do. It's a great question and yeah, not easy to, to answer. A few more questions, three more to be exact, and then we're done. Tara wants to know, have you ever had sciatica? If so, how did you handle it? Did you still train or did you rest until you recovered? If you still trained, did you change anything about how you trained while, while having sciatica? Good question. The sciatic nerve uh, goes from, you know, from your back and runs down your, your leg, essentially. Uh, especially behind the hamstrings and the glutes. That's where sciatica pain typically shows up. I haven't had a lot of problems with it, to be honest. I get it when I'm driving uh, and I have to put a book or something underneath my butt cheek uh, after a while in order to alleviate it. I don't know that much about it, so I couldn't really give you a great answer, unfortunately. What I can say, though, is that I like to sometimes, if, I'm, if I've done some heavy lifting or running, I like to hang from a, a bar, just like a dead hang. Um, because it sort of uh, elongates your spine and alleviates some of the pressure because over over the course of the day and and during heavy lifting and heavy running you compress the back and the the back compression causes sciatica pain usually by irritating the nerve at the side of the back and so one way to do it is to hang and and do some stretches maybe to sort of open it up a little bit and of course get enough sleep because when you're lying there horizontal those pads in between your back they open up again another thing is to strengthen your back so that you have a strong back uh, that does not compress as much because the muscles take a lot of the load rather than your back and um, that the best way to do that is to to lift weights quite heavy weights but of course again you do want to build up to it very gradually um, I would recommend the deadlift, for example. Doing deadlifts are great for back strength and for just good human fitness and health. So I would probably recommend that. Um, in terms of whether you should rest until you recover, etc., I'm not quite sure. You should probably talk to a physiotherapist or something about that. And I do recommend doing that, though. If you have this issue now, just go to a physiotherapist, you know, get an appointment and just get some advice, some expert advice, even if it's a short 15 minute consultation, just to get some general advice on what to do, uh, because uh, there's no point in just waiting around for it to get better if it doesn't. Uh, you're sort of wasting your time if that happens. So just get expert advice and do what you need to do. And I hope you feel better soon. Um, I, do, I do know a lot of runners with sciatica pain though, and they typically say that they're able to train through it uh, and sort of manage it, right? And it doesn't really necessarily get that much worse. Churn. I'm wondering how beneficial it would be to keep moving on rest days, like going for walks or something. I'm assuming that the benefit would be of increased blood flow or is it better to rest and minimize movement? That's a great question that I've also covered in past videos. I think it's difficult to say, I, I don't know if anyone knows the definite answer to this but I will say that uh, my opinion is that it really depends <laughs> so 
yes, it's because of the increased blood flow, right? So that's the idea, right? Like if you if you move you and, and you run a little bit easy on a rest day, you'll get more blood flow to the area and you'll you sort of repair your muscles and tendons, etc. a little bit faster, right? Yes, but at what cost, right? Because if you had a really taxing session yesterday, maybe you really need to rest today in order for your system and your endocrine system and just the energy systems to, to recover fully. So it's a matter of your structural system versus your system as a whole. And I think your system as a whole, in terms of your energy levels, your fitness gains, and your um, endocrine system, etc., is better off, your hormones and stuff, it's better off resting completely. But your structural system is probably, well, sometimes that's also better off resting completely if it was really, really taxed. Um, the other question is, can you get away with doing light training while still recovering? Because if not, how would you be able to accumulate enough total volume to be good at endurance sports, right? You need to accumulate a lot of volume, which means that even on rest days, you need to get in a few hours, well, a little bit of training. And if you keep it light, you'll probably be able to do it while recovering. So yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. I'm not entirely sure, basically. Last question, Vesna wants to know, what kind of socks do you recommend, running socks? I recommend Injinji socks. I-N-J-I-N-J-E. I, sorry, at the end, I. Injinji socks, okay? They're the toe socks that I bought because I had Vibram five finger shoes and they're the only socks that fit, or there are probably other brands too, but, um, and then I started liking them so much that even now that I'm running in normal running shoes, I just enjoy toe socks because they feel better. They allow my foot to move more naturally inside the shoe and my toes to splay. And I avoid um, blisters because they protect, you know, against chafing in between the toes. And I just enjoy them. So those are the socks that I recommend. Wow, lots of question, long video. Um, thanks though for your questions. I think a lot of them were really great questions. If you have more questions, if you want some assistance perhaps in your running journey, remember that I do offer coaching and it might be as simple as sending me an email and asking me some questions. And that's not necessarily going to mean that I'm, that it's coaching, right? You can ask me questions and I'll answer them if I have time or when I have time. And if you want formal coaching, we can arrange for that too. And of course, give it a like the video, share with your friends and have an awesome day and happy training. Leave a comment, let me know what you think about what I told you or what I answered based on your question and stay tuned for more videos. Alrighty, bye.